and warm in here. It is warm. It is never that. Wednesday uh, night, we're still studying the book of Mark. Um, meals at 6 o'clock. Bible studies at 6.45. The youth group will meet at 6.45. Also in the youth group. We got a biggest meeting next Sunday, 4.30. Uh, we're going to be hosting a parents' night out on December 17th from 5.30 to 8. There is a sign-up sheet in the vestibule there. Um, it's a good opportunity to get really kids, grandkids, whatever for that weekend, or for that hour, two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, Got a live nativity scene coming up on the 18th from 5 to 7. Again, sign up sheets from the best of you. December 21st, December 28th, there's no Wednesday night services. There'll be a candlelight service on Christmas Eve, um, between 5 and 5 30. Our Christmas service will be at 4 p.m. Christmas Day on the 1st of January our New Year's worship will be at 11 o'clock there will be no Sunday school at that time uh, Dick the week myself you know, or me, Brother Danny or any of the deacons if you need some help um, there's a December birthday the children's church schedule and I was told this morning early that we're going to be taking up two offerings today, one for our regular and one for body wounds offering. Is there any other announcements? Uh, Brother Joe, I would like to say uh, the Christmas parade, as you guys know, has been rescheduled. I don't have a date yet, but I'll afford that along once we have it. Um, if you're planning on attending, please attend the next one. And then um, I, I believe, Jimmy can correct me if this is wrong, but I believe that if you want to give toward Lottie Moon at any other time during this month, uh, if you'll just designate it by putting it in that little envelope that's in your bulletin today, that way we know where, where you want it to go, uh, you can give any time this month. Let's go, Lord. Lord, you have you have mentioned a lot of names every day. Um, just I don't know, even know how to start. <coughs> just keep everybody safe. Um, keep Todd Carter, Vicky Carter safe. And, you know, she's lost a loved one. Also, Brenda lost a loved one. Um, her church family. Um, just keep everybody, keep in mind people that's going to be having surgeries, upcoming surgeries. Also, the flu and the COVID's going on again. So, I mean, in the RSV, keep everybody safe. Heal them, Lord. Help them, Lord. Uh, I pray for, you know, this church, the congregation, keep everybody safe, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <coughs>
We are continuing our sermon series called Christmas at the Movies. Christmas at the Movies. It's actually been a couple of years since we did this series, but we are picking up where we left off. Uh, in case you weren't there or in case you don't remember, uh, Christmas at the Movies is a series of messages where each Sunday we take a different film from Christmas holiday seasons, uh, a classic, and we take each one of those films and we pull out a spiritual truth from that film, biblical truths that can be found in the themes or in the subplots of these holiday films. Uh, if you were here two years ago, then you know that we've already covered the Santa Claus, uh, we covered Elf, uh, and we covered Wonderful Life. This year, the plan is to cover four more films, so don't miss a single one of them. We are going to dive deep, but we're going to have a lot of fun this Christmas. This might be a little bit different than some of you guys are used to. But that brings us to our passage, 1 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to begin in chapter 7, and then we're going to move on, and we're going to move into 8. Uh, so stay with me. Picking up in verse 15. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all of those places. He was the first traveling circuit preacher, I guess. Verse 17, but he always went back to Ramah where his home was, and there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. Moving into chapter 8. And when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, and they accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, You're too old, <laughs> and your sons, they don't follow your ways. So appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. A king. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house today. Lord, I thank you for those who have gathered to worship you and to make much of your name. Father, I know that there are plenty who would much, much rather be here than where they are this morning. Those who are sick, those who are grieving. And so, Father God, I pray, Lord, for them. I pray, Lord, that you would give them comfort and peace. Father, I pray, Lord, that they would know your presence and they would feel it fiercely. Holy Spirit, I know that you are also here with us. And so, God, I just thank you for your presence. Lord, speak to us today, God. Even though we are taking a creative way of doing it, Lord, we are still proclaiming the truth. And so, God, I pray that you would open our heart to hear the truth this morning. Father God, Lord, I pray that what we do, what we say, everything that's going on this morning would be done to please your name from the smallest of welcome to the songs, to the word and to our prayers. Father God, may it bring praise and glory to your name. I pray all these things in your holy, precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The year was 1980. 1983 and there was this little film produced by MGM Studios it was to be released during the Thanksgiving holiday and it was and it did not do well it did not do well at all for uh, for a fact but after it went out of the theaters word of mouth began to spread people began to talk about this and this movie was picked up by cable TV where it was run every holiday season and it was at the local video rental shop that's a weird saying town nowadays isn't it a video rental store Wow and there it became one of the most successful Christian uh, Christmas successful I'm so tired today guys I'm sorry this is you have no idea how tired I am this week it became one of the most successful Christmas films of all time. In fact, every year since 1997, there's been a standing tradition on TV for this film to be aired 24 straight hours from Christmas Eve to Christmas Day. Anybody know what the movie is? A Christmas story. A Christmas story. A Christmas story follows this semi-fictional family. I say semi-fictional because it's based a little bit off of the author's own life stories. Uh, a semi-fictional family in the late 1930s. The family of young Ralphie Parker. Ralphie Parker. As he comes to terms with learning how to appreciate his family. Learning to grow up. And, and remembering the joys of his Christmas youth. In case you haven't seen 
seen it in a while, there's this one main plot throughout this film that little Ralphie dreams of one particular gift from Santa. Do you know what it is? A Red Rider air rifle. BB gun is what we would have called it growing up. Check this film clip out. Uh, Ralphie wants an air rifle. Like I said, some of you might be familiar with the term BB gun or pellet gun. That's what we called it when I was growing up. But he doesn't want just any air rifle. He wants an official Red Rider carbon action 200 shot range model air rifle. You couldn't hardly make it out. He was just like, blah, 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 could you? Oh, man. Can you relate to that at all? I mean, wanting something like really, 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 really bad for Christmas, so bad, and you're dropping hints to everyone. It probably wasn't an air rifle, but do you remember wanting something more than anything else that you've ever wanted in the entire world? For me, it was a BMX freestyle bike, and one year I finally got it, and I was just enraptured. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. But what did you want? Do you remember? Tell me. Somebody shout them out. What did you want? What? What? A what? A poodle? A four? I thought you said a poodle. I'll get you a poodle and not a four wheeler. <laughs> a poodle. What else? Something over here. Space invaders. Space invaders. Wow, you nerd. <laughs> I love it. Space invaders. Anybody else? A pair of jeans. A pair of jeans. A, oh, a pair of Jordash jeans. Ooh, I know what generation you grew up in. Wow. Of course, we still want things, don't we? I mean, it's just that it's just as you get older, they start to be a little bit more expensive. They're bigger. Maybe they're a little bit less obtainable. But as a general rule of thumb, if you want to try to curb your lust for just stuff at Christmas time, you should ask yourselves a series of questions, such as how much is this going to cost me? And maybe not even just financially, but how much is it going to cost me to get this thing? Or, or what are the pros and, and cons of having it? M may there be problems associated? Is there something that's going to rise up, a problem in my life or in my relationships, or maybe even my relationship with God if I were to get this thing that I wanted? Would God want me to have it? And if not, then why do I feel so desperately that I need it? Those are all questions, believe it or not, that the children of Israel should have asked themselves. But they didn't. And it cost them severely. In the passage we read earlier, Israel had been governed by, by spiritual leaders, men of God, prophets of God, appointed by God. Key word, God. And now they've decided that there's something else that they want. Something else that they need. They're not satisfied being marked by a nation governed by God alone. They want a king. They need a king like really, 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 really bad. If you look back again at 1 Samuel chapter 8, 4 and 5 is the verses. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you're too old and your sons don't follow your way. So appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Such as all the other nations have. We call it keeping up with the Joneses today. I guess it was keeping up with the Philistines back then. They looked around them and they decided that we need what everyone else has got. Maybe, maybe we'd be better off in the hands of man than in the hands of God. And in many ways, we often do the same things. We can do the same things. Like, like Israel's need for a king and Ralphie's need for an air rifle. Something catches our eye, something shiny and new, and, and maybe it's something that someone else has, or maybe it's something physical, tangible. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a position that you feel like you deserve. Maybe it's an idea or even a behavior that you want to claim for yourself, and we decide that we need that right now. We want it really bad and it doesn't matter what God has to say about it because we're no, look, no longer looking for God's direction. Instead, we're looking to ourselves. And that, brothers and sisters, is the essence of all sin. Our inner desires take precedence over what God would desire for us. Now, is that to say that every single thing that we ever want in life is bad? No, there are noble pursuits in life. But even then, you have to ask yourselves a series of questions. 
Will this bring honor to God? Is it going to affect my relationship with him? Could it keep me from, from everything that God wants from me? Is it going to please him to give this to me? And if not, then why do we feel like we need it? Hold that thought for just a second. <laughs> you look like a deranged Easter bunny. <laughs> One of my favorite mo moments in a Christmas story is that moment when Ralphie walks down those steps in that pink bunny onesie. I mean, that suit is just absolutely ridiculous, but it's also iconic. It's one of the most iconic things about the whole movie. And you can tell by the way that Ralphie is acting that he is absolutely miserable. Absolutely miserable. Is it any wonder why he would want an air rifle? Ralphie's at that age where he's trapped between childhood and adulthood. And Aunt Clara, who, by the way, also thinks he's a girl. <laughs> Aunt Clara and his parents and the bullies in town, they all think that he's a child. But he doesn't feel like a child. He doesn't feel like a child. So what's furthest thing from a, a, a fluffy pink bunny onesie? A Red Rider rifle. Do you see? Ralphie is running from something. The truth is, he doesn't want to be seen as a child anymore. The children of Israel were running. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 and 6 and 8, but when they said, Give us a king to lead us. This displeased Samuel. And so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all the people, to what all the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until today, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are now doing to you. It wasn't about the rifle as much as it was about feeling grown up. For the children of Israel, it wasn't as about a king as it was about a rebellion against God. God told Samuel, don't take their demands personally because it wasn't really about Samuel. The truth is that they were rebelling against God. They didn't want to answer to him. And so they thought that a king or other God or the culture around them were more attractive. They were shiny and new. And so as I said earlier, when we find ourselves chasing after something, even something worthwhile, we've got to ask ourselves, why do I feel that I need this? Are we trying to fill a void? Are we running from something? Maybe you're running from fear or obligation. Maybe you're running from a, a, a sore subject that you don't like talking about. Maybe you're trying to fill the void of loneliness or of doubt. Or maybe, just maybe, you're wanting free from a God who desires holiness and our worship. A God who promises to be our God, but then calls us to be his people. And sometimes that's hard. And sometimes we don't like that. And so instead, we run. And we demand a king. A king who in the end just looks like us. And God allows us to pursue what we want. He gives us the king. He gives us the red rider even though we're probably going to shoot our eye out. Oh, man. 1 Samuel chapter 8, 9 through 21. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. 
And so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields and the vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants and your male and your female servants and the rest of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king that you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. And then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all that the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. And the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Ralphie would bounce back from this incident with the rifle. But the children of Israel weren't so lucky. Everything that the Lord had warned them about would come to pass, and even more so. Israel was given King Saul, and at first, his reign seemed like a good thing. They were prosperous with several military victories. However, Saul was a selfish, prideful man whose pride and jealousy would end up costing him his throne. Even worse... His sinful behavior would drive him mad, literally mad. It cost him God's blessing, and it eventually led to his suicide on the battlefield. Israel was never the same. After the reign of just three kings, the kingdom of Israel was torn apart. The nation was divided. Sometimes there is no worse an outcome than getting what we want. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes there is no worse an outcome than getting exactly what we want. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, God says, No, you said to me, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. And so now here is the king you've chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has given you a king. They'd gotten what they'd wished for and they regretted it terribly. And maybe you know what that's like. You've, you have had times in your life when you've turned your back on the Lord to pursue fleshly desire and life has never been the same. It, it started out great. Maybe it felt good, but over time, that decision caught up with you and now you regret it. And I would be lying if I said that I have never been there because I have. And in those moments, all you can see is that thing that you want, that thing that you have to have, that you're so convinced that you need. And God warns you. He tries to tell you. But you don't care. You can't see it. Because you desire whatever has captivated you. And that captivation is greater than your desire for holiness and your desire to please Him and your desire to surrender. And so the enemy comes and cons you into believing that you've made the right choice and it feels good for the moment, but eventually the kingdom is torn apart. Maybe it's three kings later, maybe it's three years later, or maybe it's the very first time you take that air rifle out the back door. And I wish I could tell you that you would never feel that desire again. But the truth is, we make those decisions a dozen times every single day. Every time our flesh comes up against our Holy Spirit. And you've got to ask yourself a series of questions. Is this going to bring honor to God? How is this going to affect my relationship with him? Is it going to ruin my witness and my faithfulness 
Is it going to please Him? And if not, well, then why do you feel like you need it? Maybe you're trying to fill a void. Maybe you're running. Maybe you're just tired of answering to someone and so you want to make yourself your king. But I'm telling you, eventually, when we pursue what we want, without fail, you're going to shoot your eye out. Why do you feel like you need it? As we stand and as we sing.